Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 14th. Today, we celebrate the father of paleobotany and the botanical illustrator honored by King Charles X. We'll learn about the botanical painter who got sick of painting flowers. He'd painted 800 of them. And the botanical illustrator who worked for Curtis's Botanical Magazine and Kew Gardens. Today's unearthed words feature the hidden and often unappreciated transformations happening in our gardens during January. And we grow that garden library with a book that helps us understand plant physiology through an intimate and entertaining memoir. I'll talk about a garden item that can help you propagate your house plants, and then we'll wrap things up with the birth flowers of January. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. First up was an article that was shared in Gardens Illustrated, and it profiled Horniman Museum's gardener, Wes Shaw. Horniman Museum and Gardens is located in Forest Hill in London. And this profile on Wes was fascinating. He said, the last place that blew me away was Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Amazing conservatories, landscaping and planting, taking horticulture to a whole new level. While I was there, I saw gardeners abseiling down the side of green walls and volunteers using tweezers to pick over the beds. Gardens should continuously change and evolve, according to Wes. He said, I never see the point of keeping something looking the same as it did at some point in the past. What's the next big project you'll be tackling in the garden? We're planning a winter garden for an area of the Horniman Gardens that needs a bit of a refresh. If you'd like to read this profile on Wes in the Facebook group for the show, just type in Wes in the search bar and this post will pop right up. Then next up is a post from Alice Fowler. It was called High Society, the Expert's Guide to Alpines. This post featured Richard Wilford, who's an alpine lover and the head of design and collection support at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Alice wrote, what Richard doesn't know about alpines isn't worth knowing. Richard said, we've got a very tall house to grow some very small plants. Alpines are surprisingly easy and hardy and perfect for tricky corners and small plots in the garden. As their name suggests, alpines are from areas of high elevation, so they love full sun, cool roots, and cold nights. You can check out Richard Wilford's Five Easy Alpines in the article. Just search for Alpine in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will appear. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of the curated posts that I find during the week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Daily Gardener Community. So the next time you're on Facebook, just go on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community and request to join. It's completely free. It'll make it so these curated articles show up in your feed. You can read them at your leisure. And I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the French botanist and the father of paleobotany, Adolf Theodore Brognard. Adolf Theodore was born in Paris. His father, Alexander, was a geologist. There's no doubt that his father's work helped Adolf Theodore become a pioneer in the field of paleobotany. 
a paleobotanist, is someone who works with fossil plants. Plants have been living on the planet for over 400 years, so there are plenty of fossil plants to study and catalog. As one of the most prominent botanists of the 19th century, Adolf Theodore worked to classify fossil plant forms, and he did so even before Charles Darwin. Adolf Theodore's work provided content for his book on the history of fossil plants in 1828. Adolf Theodore published it when he was just 27 years old. His writing brought him notoriety and gave him the moniker Father of Paleobotany. He was also called the Linnaeus of Fossil Plants. Adolf Theodore was not so much a fossil plant discoverer as he was a fossil plant organizer. He put fossil plants in order and applied principles for distinguishing them. In 1841, at the age of 40, Adolf Theodore received the Wollaston Medal for his work with fossil plants. It's the highest award granted by the Geological Society of London. I'm sure his father was very proud. Adolf Theodore was a professor at the Paris Museum of Natural History. He was the backfill for André Michaud, who had left to explore the flora of North America. Adolf Theodore's wife died young. They had two boys together, and when Adolf Theodore died, he died in the arms of his eldest son. And today, King Charles X honored the Belgian botanical illustrator Pierre-Joseph Redoute with the Legion of Honor on this day in 1825. To this day, Redoute is one of the most renowned flower painters of all time. Redoute was born into a Flemish family of painters, Growing up, his family supported themselves by creating paintings for the home and for the church. Rodute was an official court draftsman to Queen Marie Antoinette. One evening around midnight, she summoned him to appear before her, and she asked him to paint her a cactus. She was exerting her control she wanted to see if Redoute was as talented as was reported. He was. Redoute also became a favorite of Josephine Bonaparte. Redoute's paintings of her flowers at Malmaison are among his most beautiful works. Today, Redoute is best known for his paintings of lilies and roses. Roses were his specialty. And Rodute's work earned him a nickname. He was known as the Raphael of Flowers. Now, if you'd like to really treat yourself or get a special gift for a gardener in your life, you should check out the book by Werner Dressendorfer called Rodute, Selection of the Most Beautiful Flowers. This is a large coffee table book. It's probably one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. I had a woman in Pottery Barn drag me into the back of the store. They'd gotten a copy of it, and she thought I should see it. And I was floored. The cover is gorgeous, and all of the images inside are just spectacular. And again, it's called Rodute, A Selection of the Most Beautiful Flowers. Now, you don't have to get it at Pottery Barn. You can get it really anywhere books are sold. This book came out in September of 2018, and I finally just got myself a copy after mulling it over for over a year. The book features 144 paintings by Rodute that were published between 1827 and 1833, and it's truly one of my most favorite books in my own personal botanical library. 
library. Now, when this book first came out, it retailed for $150. But it's been out for over a year, and now you can get copies of this marvelous book on Rodute by Werner Dressendorfer and support the show using the link in today's show notes for $83 on Amazon. Now, I managed to get an excellent used copy on Amazon just last week for $65. So you might want to go that route as well. But you should think of this book as an investment piece. It's extraordinarily beautiful, and it really is a statement. I guarantee if you have this book sitting out, Your visitors will be sure to comment, pick it up, and look through it. They just will not be able to resist looking through the beautiful paintings. Glorious. Now, today is also the birthday of the botanical painter Henri Fontaine Latour, who was born on this day in 1836. It's kind of humorous to me that we end up discussing Henri today right after Pierre-Joseph Rodute because Henri painted flowers as well. But unlike Pierre-Joseph Rodute, Henri got so sick of painting flowers that he could find no joy in doing it toward the end of his career. Altogether, Henri painted well over 800 pictures of flowers over 32 years between 1864 and 1896. By the end of his career, the entire genre of still life flower painting was life draining to him. He despised it. Yet, It's how he made a living, and many of his paintings were bought to be displayed in homes. The painter James Whistler talked up Henri's work so much that his flower paintings were quite famous in England. In fact, during his lifetime, Henri Fontaine Latour was better known in England as a painter than he was in his native France. Henri also painted portraits as well as group portraits of Parisian artists. He even painted imaginative compositions that he enjoyed doing much more than painting flowers. But it was always the flower paintings that sold. And so he kept painting them to support himself. And today is the anniversary of the death of the exceptionally talented Scottish botanical illustrator, Walter Hood Fitch, who died on this day in 1892 at the age of 75. Fitch was one of the most prolific botanical artists of all time. His illustrations were stunning. He used vivid colors for his work. In 1834, Walter began working for William Hooker. Hooker was the editor of Curtis's Botanical Magazine. Walter's very first published plate was of a mimulus rose. He didn't know it then, but it was one down and he had over 2,700 more illustrations to go. Hooker loved Walter's work because his paintings reflected the way plants appeared in real life. They weren't fanciful or embellished, yet they were beautiful. In short order, Walter became the sole artist for the magazine. When Hooker became the director of Q, the promotion meant moving to London. He talked Walter into moving too. Pretty soon, Walter was not only making illustrations for the magazine, but for everything at Q as well. At the end of his career, around the age of 60, Walter got into a disagreement with William Hooker's son, Joseph Dalton Hooker, over his pay. Walter left his post at Q and became essentially a freelancer. In 
During his lifetime, Walter created over 12,000 illustrations that found their way to publication in various works. In Unearthed Words, there's a famous saying, slow as molasses in January. We often think nothing is happening in our gardens during the winter. As Alfred Austin said in his poem, Primroses, pale January lay in its cradle day by day, dead or living, hard to say. But this belief that January is a dead time in the garden, well, nothing could be further from the truth. Today's unearthed words are all about the productivity that takes place in our gardens in January. This first one's from Rosalie Muller Wright, who is the editor of Sunset Magazine. January is the quietest month in the garden. But just because it looks quiet doesn't mean that nothing is happening. The soil, open to the sky, absorbs the pure rainfall, while microorganisms convert tilled under fodder into usable nutrients for the next crop of plants. The feasting worms tunnel along, aerating the soil, and preparing it to welcome the seeds and bear roots to come. This next one's from Hugh McMillan, the Scottish minister and naturalist. He wrote these words in 1871. Nature looks dead in winter because her life is gathered into her heart. She withers the plant down to the root that she may grow it up again, fairer and stronger. She calls her family together within her inmost home to prepare them for being scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Here's a poem from Edward Thomas, the British poet. Over the land freckled with snow, half thawed, the speculating rooks at their nest cawed, and saw from the elm tops, delicate as flowers of grass, what we below could not see, winter pass. And then finally, here's this marvelous poem from the American poet, Edith Matilda Thomas. You think I am dead, the apple tree said, because I never have a leaf to show, because I stoop and my branches droop and the dull gray mosses over me grow. But I'm still alive in trunk and shoot, the buds of next May I fold away, but I pity the withered grass at my root. You think I am dead, the quick grass said, because I have parted with stem and blade, but under the ground I am safe and sound with the snow's thick blanket over me laid. I am all alive and ready to shoot, come dancing here, but I pity the flower without branch or root. You think I am dead, a soft voice said, because not a branch or root I own. I have never died, but close I hide in a plumy seed that the wind has sown. Patient, I wait through the long winter hours. You will see me again. I shall laugh at you then out of the eyes of a hundred flowers. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, A Garden of Marvels by Ruth Kessinger, one of my favorite authors. The subtitle to this book is How We Discovered That Flowers Have Sex, Leaves Eat Air, and Other Secrets of Plants. This book came out in April of 2015. Ruth Kassinger didn't always have a green thumb. In this book, she'll tell you that until she completely understood how plants actually worked, she couldn't know precisely what they needed. 
her story starts out this way. This book was born of a murder, a murder I committed. The victim, it turns out, was a beloved kumquat tree. Ruth had decided to prune it. Her efforts made the tree turn brittle and brown. It made her wonder, why did the kumquat die when a rose bush and a crepe myrtle that was pruned the very same way were both thriving? The dilemma is what made Ruth begin a quest to understand more about plant physiology. This book is part memoir and part science class. Ruth writes with a friendly voice. This book is a beautiful way to learn basic botany. And while we're learning botany from Ruth, we also get to know her personal stories. I love the one where she tells about how at middle age, she created her own conservatory right inside her home. And it made her feel more appreciative and slow down and be more mindful. Ruth also shares how she learned to become a better gardener in general. Initially, Ruth made the mistakes that we all make, overwatering, underfertilizing, forgetting to water, and making untrue assumptions about what plants need. You can get a used copy of A Garden of Marvels by Ruth Cassinger, beautiful book, and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $5. What a deal. And here's a great gift for gardeners. It's a three-bulb vase that's all incorporated into a wooden stand. They kind of swing on this rod that's held up by this wooden support. In fact, the wooden frame kind of has an antique look about it, and you can place it on your desktop. I like to use the decorative vases for propagating plants like my Hoya, Pothos, Swedish Ivy, and so on. It's a great plant prop for your home. It's gorgeous. The frame is made of natural wood. It's got a mottled surface. And then you have these three bulb vases that are made from heat-resistant silicone glass. It's about six inches high and 11 inches wide, four inches deep. And you can get this three bulb vase with the wooden stand for $23.99 and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. January's birth flowers are the carnation and the snowdrop. Let's take a moment to celebrate both. Carnations are some of the world's oldest flowers. They've been cultivated over 2,000 years. The Greeks and the Romans use them in garlands. Carnations are part of the Dianthus family. Their Latin name is Dianthus carophyllus. The etymology of the word Dianthus is from two Greek words, dios, meaning divine, and anthos, meaning flower. And the translation of Dianthus means flower of the gods. So don't diss carnations. Carnations have different meanings based on their color. White carnations symbolize good luck and pure love. Pink carnations represent admiration. And a dark red carnation represents affection and love. Now on to January's other birth flower, the snowdrop, or Galanthus. Snowdrops were named by Carl Linnaeus, who gave them the Latin name Galanthus nivalis, which means milk flower of the snow. Snowdrop is a common name. They were also known as candle moss veils because they typically bloom around candle moss or February 2nd. 
Snowdrops are an indicator flower, signaling the transition from winter into spring. Thus, the meaning of a snowdrop blossom is hope. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.